Coming over and into the valley, the trail rises into a meadow where a lightning burn is healing. On the far side, the land falls away through the spruce. Straight ahead is sky, the sky over the great valley. There is a sweet exhilaration and coming to the summit of a pass where the brightness ahead shines through the last dark band of trees. The weight of a pack sack lightens. The hard part is done. The possible opens before us. 18th century pioneers passing over the Appalachians into the Ohio Valley wrote often of this feeling of being freed, of encumbrances, of fresh beginnings, judging from what they said and from what has been said of them subsequently. Most of them shared the misconception that they were entering an ample emptiness intended to be theirs alone. All right. Listen to what he's saying. This wasn't yours. There was people here. And again, remember, these pioneers are not all so-called white people, okay? Let's not forget all the history. In fact, they carried more baggage than they knew. Only a few were able to cast off their preconceptions. And only after much bloodshed, the Western vastness was not empty. Several hundred thousand people was already there and determined to resist invasion. Nor was it without its own history, as the Europeans slowly acknowledged after an encountering profusion of very large ruined buildings. Whatever may have been the Edenic expectations of the newcomers, it became obvious that the Indians of the valley were the survivors of much larger populations. Hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> so I just wanted to start reading right away, but uh, just want to say hi. Thanks for uh, tuning in once again. Uh, today, we're going to be reading from uh, this book. We were just reading from it. That was just a little bit of the introduction. Uh, this book's called Hidden Cities, The Discovery and Loss of Ancient North American Civilization. Roger G. Kennedy. Okay. And it says, the world of the first Americans was richer greater, more wondrous by far than most of us have ever imagined or than most histories have ever even implied. Few realize that some of the oldest, largest, and most complex structures of ancient archaeology were built of earth, clay, and stone right here in America, in the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys, Ohio, the start of it all. We're gonna have a future video on Ohio. From 6,000 years ago until quite recently, North America was home to some of the most highly advanced and well-organized civilizations in the world, complete with cities, roads, and commerce. From the lost city of Balbancha near New Orleans to the Great Hopewell Road, a causeway for religious pilgrims along the Ohio River in the 13th century. This is way before... Europeans came supposedly, right? A pilgrimage <laughs> causeway along the Ohio River? 
13th century, 1200s, okay? That's the 1200s. These cultures built hundreds of thousands of structures of which a small but tantalizing portion still remain. Like the Druids of Salisbury Plain, they patterned extraordinarily precise geometry according to the rising and setting of the moon. Like the ancient Egyptians, they organized millions of hours of human labor to construct pyramids, platforms, and plazas. So here's a picture of Roger uh, G. Kenny, pretty important guy, actually, when I was doing research about him. Uh, I'm going to read to you a little bit what it says here. It says, and remember, this is the author, right? So it's, it's the, he's the director of the National Park Services. He was the, basically under Bill Clinton. That's why he that was his... Uh, job under Bill Clinton's administration and is the former director of the American History Museum, all right, director at the Smithsonian Institution. Okay, he is the author of Rediscovering America 1990 and Orders from France, the Americans, and French in a Revolutionary World. Okay, he's also saying he was a, a polymath whose career included banking, television production, historical writing, and museum administration. The last as the director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. This is the guy who wrote this book we're about to read. He's about to tell us some, he's about to drop some bombs <laughs> on everybody. And um, it's not the first time we hear about him. We actually have shown him um, in a documentary uh, video we're going to show that real quick right now, real quick, a little segment of it. While serving as the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, historian Roger Kennedy was shocked to learn for the first time that massive ancient city remains existed in North America. Very, very few of us were conscious of the immensity of a place like Monk's Mound at Cahokia, opposite St. Louis, which is bigger in its footprint than the Great Pyramid at Giza. We didn't know that. Most Americans have no idea that ancient cities with advanced architectures once dotted the ancient North American landscape. <music> Director Kennedy has since coined a name for such places what I call hidden cities. I use the term because these were very big places. There were more people, we now know, in Cahokia, across from St. Louis, than there were in London or Rome. All right, so that was just him talking right there, you know, giving a little, you know, the drop right there in the video and the documentary we've shown before. That's a great documentary. We've shown the whole documentary in different parts of, the, of my videos, like all of it many times. So make sure to go back through my old videos and um, you'll, uh, especially the Untold, Untold Ancient American Truth series, you might run into that whole documentary. Uh, so go ahead and check it out. We return now to the book, Hidden Cities, The Discovery and Laws of Ancient North American Civilization by Roger G. Kennedy. So earlier we were in the introduction again, and we were talking about how um, the Indians of the Valley were the survivors of much larger populations, even along the headwaters of the Ohio, on the banks of mountain brooks, there were signs of ancient habitation in the form of small burial mounds. As the streams grew larger, so did the buildings on their banks below Pittsburgh at Grave Creek in what is now West Virginia. A conical mound is still today 2,700 feet, 251 meters in circumference and 70 feet, 21 meters tall. It was built by Indians while Rome was young. While Rome was young, huh? What if Rome was over here? <laughs> Scores of structures almost equal to its bulk still remained, offering the commentary of the elders upon the coal dumps and slag heaps of the rust belt as the flares of this consolate gas works flicker where beacon fires once blazed in the ohio and mississippi valleys tens of thousands of structures were built between six and 66 centuries ago 66 centuries ago all right 
that might be they might be even way older than that that's what their dates they give them you know based on their ra uh, radiocarbon dates right again but in the ohio mississippi valley tens of thousands of structures right tens of thousands of structures some as large as 25 miles and extinct 25 miles do you hear that 25 miles in extent required over 3 million person hours of labor. A lot of people to work that, or maybe not. <laughs> maybe they had a smarter way to do it than just uh, through a massive labor of, you know, many people. Like they show us, you know, how they build the pyramid, supposedly. So in one of my parts in Untold Ancient American Truth series, uh, we go over these uh, books regarding the mounds. Great information. Make sure to check those out. Um, you know, go back to that series again. Uh, if you let into this whole uh, hidden history, archaeology and all that, especially in Americas, that's a great series. And uh, we've gone over some great books that corroborate with what we're reading right now, you know, from the Smithsonian's director. OK, sometimes even so late as now, one of us may have experienced as unexpected and full of wonder as those of the first French trappers and British traders when they came among these structures. In the summer of 1991, I was in a cave searching beneath Indiana for a source of a white mineral called aragonite, which was much favored for sculpture by the Ohio Valley Indians of the third and fourth centuries. I had passed through a succession of caverns and slippery, narrow passageways. There had been no graffiti for half a mile, and I permitted myself the proud thought that I was the first of my species to come there. Then my heat lamp showed on the floor the twisted fibers of the butt end of a torch, and there were sandal marks in the dust. I was laid by a millennium and a half. This discovery should not have come as a surprise to me. But though I have been writing American history for nearly 50 years, it was. Others know about the cave, and as the graffiti, some more than a century old, demonstrate all the knowers were not scholars. But as I talked with friends about the probability that Indians were seeking stone for sculpture in Indiana caves, while the Emperor Augustus was losing legions in the German forest, I found that I was not alone in my ignorance of America's ancient past. He's realized, he's like, wow, what is all this stuff I'm finding? He had access. Remember, this is an important dude, whatever his connections were. He had a lot of titles. Again, a polymath. What is a polymath? It says that a polymath is an individual whose knowledge spans a substantial number of subjects known to draw on complex bodies of knowledge to solve specific problems. So, Von Woven defined polymathy as knowledge of various matters drawn from all kinds of studies, ranging freely to all the fields of disciplines as far as the human mind. All right, so this is the kind of guy that's writing this. So he's admitting that he was ignorant on America's ancient past. He has all these connects. So he's realizing something. This book began with my discovery of the torch and sandal marks. They led me to learn as much as I could about the people who left them in that cave. And also by why only a few specialists seem to be informed about them. What did the first European explorers and settlers know about ancient America? Why was that knowledge not passed on? Why was it not passed on, expanded, revised, and made a necessary prelude to American history? Is he snitching on himself? You were the director, bro. The antiquities of Mexico or of Egypt are far better known than those of Indiana, Illinois, or Ohio, and not because they are larger or more ambitious intellectually. Okay, he has a very strong point, and this is what I was saying earlier. There's a future video, and this is why we're getting into this right now. I want to show you guys how deep it goes, right? We go step by step. We're going to show all the correlation. Again, I got a future video on Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, all these places, what they found in these caves, along the rivers, on the mounds, all that, because nobody has really done it. As he's saying here, this is director of the Smithsonian, director of the museum and everything. As I have learned, there is as much to say about your American lack of understanding of Indian history, as there is to say about the Indians themselves. The first generation of Western colonizers had little to prepare them for the possibility of ancient cultures as they came into the 
upper reaches of the Ohio Valley between 1770 and 1810. Daniel Boone did not read Spanish, and he knew only what he had been learned of the West by the French and by the Charleston traders. To remember, Charleston, South Carolina, Huguenots, who had traveled to the Mississippi before he came into Kentucky. The traders had come out of the Southern Carolinas, all right, traders, merchants, and reached the Mississippi, South Carolina, by routes which happened to bypass all the major mound centers. Though the French had been installed around Nashville for decades in terrain full of ancient ruins, they did not provide forewarning of massive archaeology to their competitors from Carolina or Kentucky. They were mercantile folk, all right, businessmen. They didn't care about the mounds, these businessmen. Who was these early pioneer businessmen, huh? Neither by training, inclination, nor the bequilments of leisure were they to be diverted from their goods and ledgers. None of these early merchants, like I said, they were calling them traders, and I told you they were really just merchants who were the merchants, Sephardic Jews, crypto Jews, crypto Muslims. A lot of these people were the merchants, as they were telling you right here, especially when we're dealing with people from South Carolina. A lot of them are Huguenot, Moorish people, uh, Jew, Sephardic Jews. They had the money. They had all the shops, all the trades. And it makes sense that, you know, as they went out, they were looking to make more money. They didn't really care about archaeology or, you know, preserving these mounds or studying them. So, again, none of these early merchants was leisured and none seems to have had the time for wonder. So from the 1680s until the 1770s, antiquity slumbered as commerce fretted and scratched overhead. Antiquity, it is true, had only recently gone to slumber. As time was counted in the valley, it had been wide awake when in 1539 a Spanish expeditionary force led by Hernando de Soto hacked and burned its way through active mound building cultures from the Georgia Piedmont to the plains of Texas. All right, do you hear? Hernando de Soto, he's a Sephardic Moorish Jew, okay? And then he brought 600 soldiers. We have a book we've read about that. 600 soldiers. And look what he was doing again. Hacking and burning through all these mound building towns, cultures from Georgia to Texas. But antiquity was silent soon enough. The would-be conquistadors who emerged into the Appalachian Providence from Florida left a legacy. Though they did not establish colonies, their legacy was disease. After their microbes strong to accelerate the destruction already underway by those already loose by sailors and slavers along the coast upon the Indians, all right, they weren't, where, who were they enslaving? Again, and what coast? Not the Guinea coast, over here, right? Indians, remember, who did not have the appropriate antibodies. An unbroken Indian tradition of many centuries was removed from the scene. It had been destroyed not by force of arms. De Soto's entrada was a failure, but by the silent, insidious actions of European plagues. That's what they were bringing. De Soto was the first force of Europeans to enter the watershed of the Ohio, a region of the British later called the Western Waters. And Boone, even had been fluent in Spanish, would have learned little about what to expect in the West. The Spanish interest in his culture was limited to what pillage might be gotten from its temples and palaces. De Soto's study of its architecture did not go beyond determining the best means to storm its fortifications. So his chroniclers lavished little language upon accounts which might have forewarned the English or the French or Boone about the ancient buildings of the West. Not until the end of the 18th century did some Euro-Americans begin to show real curiosity and the history of their land and its peoples. Some of the seekers and invaders who entered under the flags of Spain and Great Britain were pinkish in skin tone. All right, listen to this. This is a major drop he's about to drop. Hold up. Hold up. Are you guys ready? Because I know people will be thinking I just be making things up when I'm talking about these black, so-called black Europeans, right? 
So listen to what he says. It says, some of the seekers and invaders who entered under the flags of Spain and Great Britain, right? English and Spanish, right? Supposed, right? Were pinkish in skin tone. Others were brown, brownish. Again, others were brownish or blackish, so-called blackish, <laughs> blackish, brownish, swarthy. Swarthy what? Spaniards, Great Britain, or Brit English? Remember, a lot of these are the same people because they're just cryptos. They're the same people. Again, the director of the Smithsonian Institute, this guy knows a lot. A polymath, right? He, they, you know, they call him a polymath. He's letting you know he can, he knows the truth. We got we got others that are brownish or blackish. And I bet you there's a majority of brownish or blackish over the pinkish. <laughs> some were free, some slaves. Again, some were free, some slaves. That includes most likely the pinkish ones too. Don't just think the pinkish ones are the free ones. The pinkish ones could be the slaves. Some indentured servants or slaves for a term. The pinkish ones, masters or servants, discern themselves as distinguished by skin color from the darker peoples among them. All right. He's told you right here. The pinkish ones, both servants and masters. They turn themselves as distinguished by skin color from the darker peoples among them. All right. Darker peoples among them. Who was coming over here? Not just white people or pinkish, as he's calling them. All right. Again, the director of the Smithsonian Institute. Go complain to him. So they wanted to distinguish themselves from the darker people among them, whether slave or free. All right. Darker people who were free. They weren't all slaves and they weren't Africans. And from the people already present in the valley the races were then said to be white black and red though of course not a single person so described was or is in fact white black or red listen to what he's telling you right here crayon colors the color scheme was artificial but within it were categorized people of an infinite variety of colors infinite variety of colors we're talking about europeans they didn't just come looking so-called white or pinkish they had an infinite variety of colors okay rewards and penalties were meted out for no better reason than occupancy of one or another of those artificial categories one of our primary themes will be how in the valley these people newcomers and those who had been there for thousands of years played out their prejudices about each other the occasions of grace they had the benefit of a shock of discovery and a few instances in human history has architecture been so important in altering the impressions of the nature of one people in the eyes of others the founders had not anticipated that they would find in the West large, sophisticated, and ancient work performed by the kind of people still resident there. That architectural evidence was too obtrusive to be ignored. The new cities of the Central Valley, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Marietta, Portsmouth, Lexington, Pittsburgh, Natchez, and Nashville had to be built by clearing away evidence of older ones in the countryside there were hundreds of thousands of earth and reminders of prior habitation there still are tens of thousands listen to what he's telling you here the shock of these discoveries forced upon the founders the possibility that indians were not all savages the founders knew nothing of ancient africa outside of a little learning about Egypt. Had they known something of it at the time they were becoming acquainted with ancient America, they might have lost their sense of Negro possibility considerably farther and by extension their apprehension of what other darker skinned people such as ancient Americans, again, dark skinned people such as ancient Americans might have done other, other the sense of other Negro possibilities considerably farther, not just in Africa. Listen to what he's letting you know right here. All right, this is a major drop. What other darker skinned people, such as ancient Amarukans, dark skinned people, ancient Americans might have done 
but they were neither so fortunate nor so bold. Nah, they didn't want to. We are so fortunate. Right now, we're fortunate. We're learning. Whoever's listening to this right now, again, this is <laughs> direct of the Smithsonian. Listen to what he knew, right? Same people are the ones hiding all the stuff, right? All the art, what they're finding. So maybe what he's doing is doing a confession while he's writing this so he can have a clean heart or so he can just feel like at least he tried to tell everybody. He just couldn't do it publicly, right? He had to write a book about it. He's letting you know, right? To think outside the box, okay? Outside of Africa, of other darker skinned people, such as ancient Americans. We are so fortunate right now though, to know this and we may be so bald, okay? We have to be bold. Knowledge of the past may help alter the present. Listen to what he's saying. All right, he's making a confession. In chapter one now, the book Hidden Cities, the founders of American architecture, the cultures that nourished them, and the great dying. The architecture of the Mississippi watershed is as old as that of Egypt. Say what? Okay. As old as Egypt or even older, we're going to see. Okay especially in Ohio and Louisiana and all these areas, they have places that are way older than ancient Egypt. But it's as old, at least, as Egypt. So where's the real Egypt? If we're talking about as old, though composed of other materials than the sandstone of the pyramids, the monuments of the Mississippi are as large in size and as regular in shape. Indeed, one of the most noteworthy qualities of ancient American architecture is that some of its forms were so regular that they were replicated precisely in locations many miles apart. The first very large buildings created in North America were constructed about 6,000 years ago. Most were made by moving earths and baskets woven of vegetable fibers. These baskets used throughout the valley for architectural work were as large as the wanigans, wicker pack sacks. Many 19th and early 20th century Americans carried on canoe trips. Some of us can still recall how heavy they were when filled. Several million baskets were filled with heavy clay for the construction of each of many structures in West Virginia, Louisiana, and Illinois. Despite so much exertion, the eroded contours of these monuments are not today very impressive. After thousands of winters, plows and pot hunters have done their work upon them. They sometimes appear to be little more than discouraged hillocks, about the shape of a rain drenched haystack. A few, however, remain very grand indeed. Careful cross-sectional archaeology reveals the layering within these ambiguous shapes, brown earth and often red clay, earth again, perhaps one or two more tiers or lenses of red black charred remains of buildings, ritually fired, we may assume, and still more earth, some of it so densely compacted that the fibrous markings of the baskets are still stamped upon it. The Spanish and French who first saw these hillocks found it difficult to believe them to be the deliberate creations of mankind. They were so much larger than any work or architecture known to them. The entire fa facade of the Palace of the Louvre in Paris can fit easily within the space surrounded by D-shaped earthen rings at Poverty Point, Louisiana. Built at the same time as Stonehenge, all right? That's how old Louisiana is. Stonehenge is debatable. That might have been built in the 1900s. The Papal Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, complete with its plaza and gardens, could be placed within the circular embankment of Watson Break, which is probably at least a thousand years older than Poverty Point. Oh, that's old. Watson Break, huh? All right, so let me just show you guys Watson Break. All right, here's a little drawing of it. I just want to show you how old this is. Watson Break is an archaeological site in present-day Wachita Parish, Louisiana, from the archaic period, dated to about 5,400 years ago. That's from their carbon dating, so it could be even older. Watson Break is considered the oldest earthwork mound complex in North America. You know the sources here? It is older than the ancient Egyptian pyramids older all right than egypt older older you got people building mounds right way before ancient egypt right 
How do you have time to build mounds and settle down? You got to have an advanced agricultural civilization where you don't have to be out all the time trying to survive, hunt, and not get killed. Where you can build mounds and practice cer religious ceremonies or do whatever they like in their free time. Creating mounds, that's a science. This is way before Egypt. Wake up. Wake up. All right, so back in the book, that's what they were talking about. Watson break, all right? The Papal Basilica can fit inside that. That's how big it is, man. That's how big that place is, which is almost 6,000 years ago. Now listen to this. The Mayan calendar opens with a mythic date of 3,372 BC. So that's before even Sumerian and, and Egyptian uh, history. By that time, the people of the Mississippi Valley by that time, though, even though the Maya started there, by that time, the people from the Mississippi Valley were already creating monumental architecture before anything so ambitious had been built in Mexico, Central or South America. Earthen buildings were arranged in strict and repeated geometric patterns along the bayous and channels in what are now the states of Louisiana and Mississippi. In the Mississippi Delta, Two of the earliest complexes, which can be dated with much precision, lie near Monroe, Louisiana. The Hespeth Mounds are on the Bayou Darboni, about 20 miles to the northwest, and probably were built around 4,500 BC. All right, these ain't savages, advanced civilizations over here. Above Frenchman's Bend on the Bayou Bartholomew. 15 miles northeast of Monroe are a row of mounds whose carbon dates establish them as about a thousand years younger. On the, that's 3,500 BC. On the campus of Louisiana State University at Baton Rouge is the most ancient evidence of the propensity of humans for architecture to be found so conveniently to, to learning anywhere in the world. Two conical mounds, the larger about 130 feet in diameter, and 16 feet high, the rich organic soil of which was put in place about 3000 BC, rich fertile soil, right? What is that? Kemet, rich black fertile soil. Kemet, Kem, Kemet, rich fertile black soil was put in place about 3000 BC, six miles north at Monte Sano. Two even earlier conical mounds were destroyed in 1967. They included platforms probably used for cremation and a structure built on post about 20 feet square, which may well have been the oldest wooden building of which the plans are clear. They destroyed this stuff. They destroyed the evidence of the true old world. They destroyed this stuff. A close approximation of what such plans might have been can be derived from the Montesano post molds where the posts have decayed, leaving spaces subsequently filled by earth compacted differently from its surroundings. What a treasure. And it was protected by the compassionate earth until people of our generation saw fit to destroy it. They destroyed it. This is the director of the Smithsonian Institute and American Museum. Okay, he's snitching. He's confessing. The story of the 5,000 year old mounds at Frenchman's Bend is so far happier. A remarkably sympathetic developer recently agreed that its principal building will not become the seventh tee of a golf course. All right, that's a big one. A lot of these mounds, a lot of these, uh, where the mounds were, they made golf courses out of them. I recall poignantly the day that concession was made and how proudly he drove away in his Land Rover more worthy of the best Abercrombie and Fitch could provide than any competitor in the Mississippi Valley. Five mounds are still discernible along the edge of the fairway. <laughs> you hear this? The largest, a low haystack shaped cone about 130 feet in diameter and 10 feet high. It's a golf course now. The relationship of the five to each other appears erratic, but appearances may not disclose lunar or solar alignments or some other order and principle we do not yet understand. About 5,000 years ago, monumental American architecture 
began to be created in circular or half circular D-shaped forms, the largest of which are so striking that they justify calling the ensuing three millennia in American architectural history, the age of the rings. Right, so uh, this book goes in depth in many of the mounds found into Poverty Point and the other one we talked about Cahokia and all of that. Again, I've, I've gone over all this information in past videos. We're going to go over it again, but I thought I wanted to go into uh, this uh, topic right here. It says Fort, Fort's Ancient. And a lot of the mud flood, uh, you know, Tartaria followers, you might find this interesting. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of these uh, structures and walls and like what it looks like fortifications in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains and forests and in the southeast and other places of the U.S. They have no explanation. A lot of the time they say uh, they were built during the Civil War. But as we're about to read, they're actually all way older. It says here, Fort's ancient. It is not love that comes to mind when one comes to the hilltop citadels in Ohio and Kentucky. A citadel is a fortress, right? European experience would seem to justify our thinking of these as castles, demonstrating a decline into the dark ages after some Pax Hope Williana. A darkness gleaming only fitfully upon Indian kings Arthur and Charlemagne. Indian kings Arthur? Indian king Arthur? What are they talking subliminal here, Mr. Director of the Smithsonian? What are we talking about? What is he talking about? With Byzantine surrogates lurking in the delta and rough Teutonoid tribes ready to swoop in upon Hopewell seniors fortifying their villas. Sad to say, scientific archaeology has forced Jetty Sonen, this romance of barbarians in a feudalized Midwest. Radiocarbon dates for these forts are from 100 to 400, all right, AD. You understand what they're telling you? These walls, these forts they're finding are from 100 to 400 AD. Radio, their radiocarbon says so. So they weren't built by no Europeans. They were already here. Now that's the date they're giving it. They could be even way older, all right? Even though 100 AD, 400 AD, are you serious? Forts, brick walls and all that? While Adina Hopewell cultures were tribing copper breastplates, mica sheets, pearl beads, and effigy pipes shaped as birds or beers or beaver have been found in the hilltop forts of Kentucky and Tennessee, interred apparently at roughly the same time as those found amid the geometric earthworks of Ohio. Do these fortified encampments, sometimes alone, sometimes seeming to be guardians of the classical octagons, circles, and squares along the paint? the rivers of Kentucky and along the Ohio from Cincinnati to Portsmouth mean that architecture became militant or perhaps apprehensive? Were these indeed fortified settlements or were they ceremonial spaces bounded by stone? And what are we to make of other roughly contemporaneous enclosures on the loomy bluffs above the Mississippi? All right, so listen to what he's gonna say. I think there are answers to be offered to these inquiries but they are answers of the imagination. They belong therefore in chapter 11, right? So we, I, I, that must be a good chapter because we got to read it, right? Some of these rock walled enclosures, again, some of these rock walled enclosures lie on terrace tops above major waterways. Those that do not guard instead very old trails from waterway to waterway. So it has something to do with keeping people safe on their journey, right? On the roads and then cross country to the sea, if that's, if they're forts, right? The route over which presides Tennessee's old stone fort apparently began in Ohio. I right, listen to this, a stone fort, a wall. What is it? A wall, we're talking about a wall fortified, what they call a rock walled enclosures or, or an old stone fort apparently began in Ohio on the Scioto. Then it crossed into Kentucky, listen, on his way to the Nashville Basin, and then cross the Cumberland to scale, and then descend the highlands to the Tennessee River at Bridgeport. From there, it made its way across Georgia to the Atlantic coast at or near St. Augustine. You hear that? You see that route? You see how long that wall was? And again, he told you already, this is a director of the Smithsonian. It was built in the AD 
100 or 400s. Okay? That's his radiocarbon. Their radiocarbon, right? That we got to trust. But it still is older than the Europeans, right? So it was built. It was already here. And look how big it was. Look how long it went. How much uh, distance it covered. When it was mapped in 1684 by the French as part of an effort to show that La Salle had conquered all this for King Louis, it had been in use for at least one millennium and probably for two, probably for two millenniums, 2,000 years, this road, this wall, 2,000 years, this wall. The Florida outcome is indicated by the presence in Hopewell burials in Ohio of ornaments made of shark and barracuda teeth from Florida, to which we have already given some attention of Ohio shirt tools in Florida, and as well by the evidence of intellectual exchange, the similarities in dimension among the circles incised into the earth at Fort Center in Florida and raised as embankments at Newark and Circleville. All right, so now I want to bring you to this book real quick since we started talking about these stone walls, right? And hidden cities, these mystery cities, these, you know, what's going on in these uh, forests, right, in North America. This book is called Mysteries of Ancient America, Uncovering the Forbidden. Uncovering the Forbidden. This is by Fritz Zimmerman. And we go to the very first uh, chapter of this book or, or topic. It's called Ancient Cities. And it says here, and they're calling A, you know, they're giving the letters up here. So they're going to be talking about the letters. It says A, B, C, D, outer walls is inches in thickness, length 56 feet, breadth 22 feet. The walls are built of rough, unhewn stone and appear to have been constructed with remarkable regularity. E is a chamber three feet in width, which was no doubt searched the whole way as some part of the arch still remains. It is made in the manner represented at three and is seldom more than five feet above the surface of the ground. But at, as it is filled with rubbish, it is impossible to say what was its original height. F is a chamber four feet wide. In some places, the remains of similar arch style remains. G is a chamber 12 feet in width, at the extremity of which are the remains of a furnace. All right, so there... So basically what they're doing is describing what they're finding here. They're going to tell you real quick what this is. And they're saying they found human bones in, the, in this place too. It says here, the Centennial History, 1877. The Commonwealth of Missouri, Centennial History. The early writers upon the antiquities of Missouri make frequent mention of the ruins of buildings which were constructed of unhewn stone and whose walls were said to have been built up with credible skill and strength though without durable mortar if indeed any were used of this kind of structure the examples are very rare east of the mississippi whether any are now to be found in any good degree of preservation is quite doubtful i will present therefore such facts concerning them as can be gleaned from the most trustworthy accounts of early writers the first to be noticed are thus described by mr lewis c beck who, after speaking of the pine timber which abounded 50 or 60 years ago along the Gasconade River and the sawmill mills erected upon its banks by which the lumber was prepared for the St. Louis market, goes on to state that near the sawmills and at a short distance from the road leading from them to St. Louis are the ruins of an ancient town. Listen to this. It appears to have been regularly laid out. And the dimensions of the squares, streets, and some of the houses can yet be discovered. Stone walls are found in different parts of the area, which are frequently covered by large heaps of earth. Again, a stone works exists, as I am informed by General Ashley, about 10 miles below the mills. It is on the west side of the Gasconade and is about 25 or 30 feet square. And although at present in a di lapidated condition appears to have been built with an uncommon degree of regularity it is situated on a high bald cliff which commands a fine and extensive view of the country on all sides from this stonework is a small footpath running a devious course down the cliff to the entrance of a cave in which was found a quantity of ashes the mouth of the cave commands an easterly view 
all right, built facing the east. It would be useless at this time to hazard an opinion with regard to the uses of this work or the beings who erected it. In connection with those of a similar kind which exist on the Mississippi, it forms an interesting subject for speculation. They evidently form a distinct class of ancient works, of which I have as yet seen no description. Another group described by the same author was located about two miles southwest of the town of Louisiana. They are built of stone with great regularity, and their side is high and commanding, from which I am led to infer that they were intended for places of defense. Works of similar kind are found on Buffalo Creek and on the Osage River. They certainly form a class of antiquities entirely distinct from the walled towns, fortifications, barrows, or mounds. The regularity of their form and structure favors the conclusion that they were the work of more civilized race than those who erected the former. A race familiar with the rules of architecture and perhaps with perfect system of warfare. The description of those works located near Louisiana is accompanied by a ground plan or diagram made by the Reverend S. Giddens, a former clergyman at St. Louis, of which figure one is an exact copy. All right, so here's another view of the drawing. The ancient city was located between bends of the Ohio and Kanawha Rivers, Cabell County, West Virginia Annals and Families, 1935. When the first white settlers came, the land was covered by forest, but at Green Bottom, they found well-defined evidence of streets laid out at regular intervals and intersected at right angles with other streets. Listen to this. Ironton raised her May 5th, 1892, where Proctorville now stands was one day part of a well-paved city, but I think the greater part of it is now in the Ohio River. Only a few mounds there one of which was near the C. Wilgus Mansion and contained a skeleton of a very large person with all double teeth and sound in a jawbone that would go over the jaw with the flesh on of a large man. The common burying ground was well filled with skeletons at a depth of about six feet. Part of the pavement was of boulder stone and part of well-preserved brick. All right, so we're reading these little clips from these articles. You can actually verify the sources if you like. I'm going to uh, start showing you guys. Shout out to Analog, um, his Twitter account. Um, the brother uh, always shares information with me. He has a lot of great uh, newspaper articles, old ones he has found with crazy information. I'm going to show you guys. I put it all together. Continues his catalog of prehistoric works east of the Rocky Mountains by Cyrus Thomas, 1891. At Sadis, opposite the mouth of the Coal River, there have been found evidences of a very large city, much larger than Charleston, okay? Large city, larger than Charleston. There are also carved stones in different places on the river. Earthworks or fortifications are also found several places, both on the Kanawha and on the Coal River river all right and I get another one here it says lost city buried beneath present-day lexington kentucky all right it says there's a dina burial mound located near lexington kentucky this is the image look at that and it says george w rank writing in 1872 also discussed this lost city buried beneath lexington i quote from dr rank the city now known as Lexington, Kentucky, is built of the dust of a dead metropolis. All right. There was a metropolis there of a lost race, so-called loss, huh? Of whom name and language and history, not a vestige is left. Oh, they don't know. All right. They, how convenient. They never know. Right. What happened? Even the bare fact of the existence of such a city and such a people on the site of the present Lexington would never have been known but for the rapidly decaying remnants of ruins found by early pioneers and adventurers to the Elkhorn lands. The testimony of the learned Professor C.F. Rafinsky of Transylvania University fully corresponds with this and proves the former existence in and about the present Lexington of a powerful and somewhat enlightened anti-Indian nation. Anti-Indian nation. Kentucky's first historian, John Filson, tells us of stone sepultures at Lexington. 
built in pyramid shape. Listen to this. They tore all this down and still tenanted by human skeletons as late as two years after the siege of Bryant's station. They are built, says he, in a way totally different from that of the Indians. Early in this century, a large circular earthen mound about six feet in height occupied a part of what is now called Spring Street between Hill and Maxwell. A stone mound which stood not far from Russell's cave in this county was opened about 1815 and found to contain human bones. <clears throat> Ice in my veins, I've been driving this train is in this lane there's no stop in this flame because i came to the game and i changed it to play how i like rearranged it to my own domain yeah i got what it takes made lots of mistakes taking shots skipping breaks feeling lost feeling great popping off singing straight never stop never changed all the squad here to play and i've got something to say yeah i work hard each and every day i get lost in the words i say i don't push pause no i push play I won't stop till I make a change I withdraw on the things I make I turn flaws into flawless traits I build tall, never cap in space I won't stop till I hear him say up again i got tired eyes need a cup of blend that's right in the am that's my only friend no light just the sun coming up on the horizon i lose track of time yeah i move fast and climb a new class divine yeah true passion shines and i'm through passing time i choose stacking dimes you snooze half the time while i move passing by uh. i work hard each and every day i get lost in the words i say i don't push pause no i push play I won't stop till I make a change I withdraw on the things I make I turn flaws into flawless traits I build tall, never cap in space I won't stop till I hear him say oh, oh, da -da 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 -da. 